Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are talking about thrombosis and antithrombotic drugs. Okay, right. So, uh, we have now discussed most of the hemostatic pathway and are in the process of discussing coagulation, which, remember, is the process by which fibrinogen, which is an inner protein uh, within the blood, um, is converted into fibrin, which is then assembled into fibrin strands. And we've now discussed the intrinsic pathway by which this happens, which occurs when, uh, well, which is initiated when uh, you have exposed collagen, which is exposed to the constituents of the uh, blood, specifically to this factor 12 or Hageman factor, which is then activated by the collagen to factor 12A. Factor 12A then, in turn, activates factor 11 to factor 11A, which in turn activates 9 to 9A, which combines with its cofactor 8A to convert 10 to 10A, and 10A combines with its cofactor 5A to convert prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin then converts fibrinogen to fibrin, and fibrin is then uh, converted uh, polymerized into fibrin strands by 13A. And I should just add one more thing on here, because I haven't told you actually uh, how you activate 13. So factor 13 here, okay, is activated to factor 13A by thrombin. So thrombin not only converts the fibrinogen to fibrin, but it also converts factor 13 to 13A, and then 13A polymerizes the fibrin together to make fibrin strands, okay? Meanwhile, the thrombin also has this other action of increasing the levels of 8A and 5A in the plasma, uh, and this leads to a positive feedback of the activation of thrombin. Okay, so this is the intrinsic coagulation cascade. Let's now look at another coagulation cascade, which is the extrinsic coagulation cascade. Okay, now the extrinsic coagulation cascade is uh, activated by tissue factor rather than by collagen. So let's draw this picture again. So here are our endothelial cells. Okay, so this is our disturbed endothelial cell here that was cut in half by some knife or something. Okay, and here is our basement membrane here, also cut in half. Here's our subendothelial connective tissue here, or subendothelial space. And then, uh, more peripheral to that, you then have the internal elastic lamina, which we'll draw in blue here. Okay, so, we've discussed that peripheral cells have on their surface this protein known as tissue factor, okay, which is also called factor 3. So basically, when the blood starts coming out of this hole, and meets the deeper layers of the blood vessel, it's going to meet cells within these deeper layers. So, for instance, there will be fibroblasts in the subendothelial connective tissue, which is the cell that actually makes the connective tissue, okay? And these peripheral cells will have tissue factor on their surface. So, here this protein, hugely amplified, of course, but nevertheless here, this is tissue factor, or this is also... Uh, referred to as factor 3, so that's its old name. Okay, and factor 3, or tissue factor, is what's going to set off another coagulation cascade. So another set of pathway, well, another pathway, which leads to the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. Okay, so this pathway is known as the extrinsic pathway. Okay, or it's also referred to as the tissue factor pathway. So you will often hear people nowadays call it the tissue factor pathway, but its old name, at least, is the uh, extrinsic pathway. So, tissue factor is this protein that is on the surface of all peripheral cells. However, as I said earlier, importantly, it is not expressed within the blood cell, the cells of the blood, okay? Uh, and it's not expressed on the apical surface of the endothelial cells. So normally, unless there is a hole in the side of the blood vessel, um, the constituents of the blood should never see tissue factor. And we've discussed how it is involved in activating platelets, and now we're going to see how it's involved in also activating a coagulation cascade. Okay, so it converts coagulation factor 7 
to 7a. And I should just add that factor 3 is unlike the other coagulation factors in that it doesn't have a inactive and an active state. It's just factor 3, and it's always capable of converting 7 to 7a. It's just it usually never ever sees factor 7 because 7 is in the blood and tissue factor is not exposed to the blood. Okay, but when you have the hole in the side of your blood vessel, 7 will come in here and it might just meet this um, cell with tissue factor on it. And the tissue factor will convert 7 to 7a. Okay, then 7a is going to convert factor 10 to 10a. Remember, coagulation factor 10 is another um, coagulation factor that's within the blood. And we've already seen this happen. We saw in the intrinsic coagulation cascade, we saw that 9a, along with its cofactor 8a, that enzyme complex, activated 10 to 10a. And 7a also does this, but it does it without a cofactor. Okay, but after this, the pathway is exactly the same. So 10a will combine with its cofactor, which is 5a, okay, and the two of them will then activate factor 2, or prothrombin, into thrombin, or factor 2a, okay? Prothrombin, also known as factor 2, and it will be activated into thrombin. Okay, and then we know what thrombin does. Thrombin converts fibrinogen, or factor 1, into factor 1a, or fibrin. Okay, and let me just bring this up in a moment. So fibrinogen, and I'll move this nicely into position, which is also called factor 1, and we're going to convert it into fibrin, also known as factor 1a. At the same time, it's going to activate factor 13a, so thrombin is also going to activate the conversion of, let's put it here, 13a, so sorry, it's going to activate the conversion of 13 here, factor 13, into 13a, okay, and then 13a will assemble the fibrin, okay, here, so it will now catalyze this reaction, into fibrin strands, okay, and these fibrin strands will then be being formed in amongst the platelets which are starting to aggregate, and they will form this meshwork that holds the platelets together. We also know that thrombin will have a positive feedback effect on this extrinsic pathway as well by increasing the uh, a level of 5A, the cofactor for 10A that you have. Okay, so this then is the extrinsic coagulation cascade by which uh, tissue factor leads to the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin, and then fibrin will be assembled into fibrin strands, and these fibrin strands will form this meshwork that holds together the uh, plate that aggregate, and you've then got a secondary hemostatic plug uh, within the whole of the blood vessel. So those, then, are the three steps of the hemostatic pathway. You get vasoconstriction to reduce the blood flow to the affected area. You then get a platelet aggregation to form a primary platelet plug. And then in amongst the platelets that are aggregating, you're getting a fibrin deposition or coagulation. So you're getting the formation of these fibrin strands from the inert compound within the blood, which is fibrinogen. Okay, and those fibrin strands will form a very dense meshwork that will hold the platelets together and make a very strong plug in the wall of the uh, blood vessel known as a secondary hemostatic plug. Okay, and that's how you stop hemorrhage. Okay, right. So what we now want to discuss is what's the difference between hemostasis and thrombosis, okay? So hemostasis is when you actually have a hole in the wall of the blood vessel which you want to, um, well, which blood is leaking out of and you want to block off. Thrombosis is when this entire pathway activates inappropriately. Thrombosis. It's when you get it activating in a blood vessel which does not have a hole in the side of the uh, wall. 
Now, generally, you do have some sort of a disease of the blood vessel before uh, thrombosis occurs, okay? So often, atherosclerosis is occurring at that portion of the blood vessel where you're going to get thrombosis. So, the blood vessel is not healthy. It should not allow thrombosis. Uh, okay, so let's show this. So here we have our blood vessel, and let's say we have our atherosclerotic plaque here. Okay, and the atherosclerotic plaque is an inflammatory response in the tunica intima of our blood vessel. It's specifically in the subendothelial space. So in the space underneath the basement membrane, you're getting inflammation, and you accumulate a large plaque in there. Okay, so I'll draw this here. So here is an atherosclerotic plaque here. Okay, and I'm just going to colour it in yellow. Atherosclerotic plaque. Now, what can happen over the surface of this atherosclerotic plaque is that you can get all the stages of hemostasis happening here, even though there is no hole in the side of the blood vessel. And when you get hemostasis, acting where it shouldn't, because there is no hole to fill. That's known as thrombosis. Okay, so the first step occurs. You get platelets adhering to the side of the endothelial cells, even though the endothelial cells have not been uh, disturbed, basically. So this is platelet adhesion. You're then going to get platelet activation, okay? So you're going to get thromboxane A2 levels going up hugely in this area. Remember, that's the overall result of platelet activation, that they release this thromboxane A2. Okay, so you're going to get thromboxane A2 levels going up hugely in this region, which I'll denote by these orange dots. This is then going to lead to vasoconstriction, so the blood vessel will constrict. Okay, uh, so you're going to get vasoconstriction, I'll put this here, vasoconstriction. Then, uh, the thromboxane A2 will also activate uh, the glycoprotein 2b slash 3a receptors on the surface of the platelets, and this will make the platelets sticky. So the platelets will start aggregating together, so you'll start getting an aggregate of platelets here. So platelets sticking on top of the platelets which have originally adhered to the uh, surface of the blood vessel. Okay, now that's the second step, so you're going to get platelet aggregation. And then, as I've previously told you, this platelet aggregate is not very strong, basically. It's actually very weak, and it would easily be broken apart, basically. So to make something that's actually solid, what you need is to get fibrin deposition in amongst this platelet aggregate. So what's going to happen is you're going to activate the coagulation cascades as well. And we discussed that this should not happen. The coagulation cascades are activated by collagen and tissue factor, which should not be exposed to it. But something leads to the activation of the coagulation cascades, okay? As though tissue factor and collagen were there. So you're going to get fibrin being deposited everywhere. So basically, you get the formation of a secondary hemostatic plug in the middle of a blood vessel. Okay, so you then get coagulation. So you get this rigid structure in the middle of the blood vessel. It's also releasing from boxane A2, so you also get vasoconstriction. Okay, and as you can see, what's going to happen, what's the result of this structure being formed? And by the way, this structure this solid mass that you've got formed of platelets and fibrin, this is what's known as a thrombus, okay? So it's not called a secondary hemostatic plug anymore, because it's not plugging in uh, a hole in any blood vessel, it's just instead occluding the blood vessel. So this is a thrombus. Okay, and this is why you shouldn't use the word blood clot, because when you use blood clot, people can use blood clot to mean uh, a hemostatic plug, a secondary hemostatic plug that is clotting the hole in a, a blood vessel, but they can also use blood clot to mean a thrombus, basically, so it's not clear whether if someone uses the word blood clot, that, well, the terminology blood clot, whether they mean thrombus or hemostatic plug. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.